proudly we hail. Hello from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. This is C.P. McGregor speaking and welcoming you to another program of Proudly We Hail, presented by your War Department. Through the courtesy of the Hollywood Coordinating Committee, we star in our play titled Freedom of the Press, Mr. Dane Clark, story written by Joe Malone with music by Eddie Scrivani. <laughs> America is known the world over for its great newspapers. This story concerns one of our early editors, James King, one of the first martyrs to the cause of freedom of the press, and his assistant, Brad Evans. Oh, Brad. Hmm? Oh, oh, here I am. Uh, the rig's outside and... Oh, Brad. Brad, you're not even ready. Ready? Oh, the picnic. This was the day of the picnic. Oh, Brad, not again. And after I especially ask Uncle James to give you the afternoon off. I'm sorry, Ellen. I haven't got any excuse. But I can still get ready if you want me to. Oh, no, no. It'd be too late. Besides, you're up to your ears in printer's ink. What in the world made you forget this time, Brad? Oh, same thing, I'm afraid. Another of your uncle's editorials. To tell you the truth, Ellen, I've been standing here debating whether to go on setting it up or to go in and argue with him about it. These are powerful men he's attacking, Ellen. You don't realize the trouble he's asking for. Oh, please, Brad. You know how I feel about that. Besides, if you believe in him as much as you say you I do... I do believe in it, but I believe in this paper, but I don't believe we're using the right method. People, at least some people, can't accept these things if you just throw it in their faces, even if it is the truth. Well, I... I don't know about that, Brad. All I do know is that Uncle is a fine, sincere man. Of course he is. And the city needs his leadership in this fight against crime and graft and crooked courts. That's why I hate to see him take such chances. He's stubborn, Ellen. Yes, I tell Brad. you... Hello, Uncle James. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I didn't hear you come in. It's all right, Brad. You've said all these things to me many times. Without much effect, I'm afraid, sir. Brad, listen to me. Well, perhaps I'd better go, Uncle. No, I want you to hear this, too. Brad, you were going to say that the truth might be tempered a little or glossed over so it won't be so ugly. I say when that happens, it ceases to be the truth. I've taken a stand, Brad, and I want you to stand beside me. But our paper, the bulletin, is not going to back down. Now that editorial, Sam or one of the other boys can finish setting it up. Do you and Ellen... No, 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 sir, no, sir. I'll, I'll stay, I'll finish it. You'll forgive me, Ellen? Well, of course, Brad. Good, then let's get to work. We've got a paper to get out. November 14th, 1855. This paper denounces one David C. Carter for his selfish grafting aims in local politics. Any astute observer need only to look at the... Oh, Brad, with music like this, you're not thinking about Uncle's editorials again. <laughs> oh, a little, perhaps. There's something a lot more important to think about. Shall we sit the rest of this one out, Ellen? Well, now that's more like it. The Bulletin, January 10th, 1856. Now the high watermark of infamy has been attained. Charles Cora, known assassin of William H. Richardson, still remains unpunished. How long will the citizens of this... Oh, isn't it beautiful? Very beautiful. But you're not watching the violinist. I know, Ellen. I'm watching you. The Bulletin, May 14th, 1856. When will our citizens awaken to the realization that J.P. Casey is defrauding the taxpayers of city funds? Together with his fellow grafters and cheats, Casey is bleeding us white. If this despicable condition persists, the future of the city will be seriously threatened. Well, Uncle 
James, Brad and I have oh, something to... Oh, uh, sorry, sir. We thought you were alone. I'd prefer to be. However, as you see, I have unwelcome company. This is Mr. Casey. Casey? That's right. James P. Casey. Oh, Uncle. It seems that Mr. Casey has been offended by our last editorial, Brad. He came here demanding an apology. And a retraction. In your next edition. I think you'll find that's impossible, Mr. Casey. He knows that. I've already told him it isn't our policy to retract the truth. I suppose you can prove it's the truth in a court of law. A court that you bribed, Mr. Casey? Oh, Uncle James, please. Never mind, Ellen. Casey, we've wasted enough time. I believe my niece here has something she wanted to tell me. If you'll excuse us. All right, King. Have it your way. But if you think this close... I'm not interested in your threats, Mr. Casey. Get out. Just get out. Very well. But we'll meet again, King, under different circumstances. Oh. I knew something like this would happen. I'm glad it did happen. And it was a pleasure. Oh, but Uncle James, if he does take it to court... Court? That was just a threat. You'll never get that far. But if it should, could we prove our statements? Everybody knows that they're true. But can we prove them? Casey can't afford to let this stop here. Have we got documentary evidence? We'll get evidence. I wrote that editorial to drive him into the open. And in the process, you've driven yourself into a corner. Oh, now, wait a minute, Brad. No, I won't wait a minute. For a long time, I've tried to point out that we've been going about this the you wrong way. You seem to forget who's running this paper, Brad. Look, you can't beat men like Casey by getting yourself thrown in jail or worse. Suppose you let me be the judge of that. All right, sir, I will. If it's my resignation you want, That you can... seems to be the only solution. Then you have it. And it may as well be effective immediately. Oh, Brad. Oh, I'm sorry, Ellen. I... I don't suppose they'll want to come with me. No, Brad. Not now. Uncle will need me. I'll have to stay. James King. Hmm? Yes? Somebody speak to me? Yes. I did. Oh. It's you, Casey. I thought we... We pause briefly to bring you an important message from the Honorable Sam C. Ford, Governor of the State of Montana, who recently said, The maximum number of voluntary enlistments in the peacetime regular army of the United States is necessary in order to release men of long service who desire to return to civilian life. It is also necessary in order to build up the regular to a strength adequate to meet our needs for occupational duty overseas and to protect our national interests. The success of the voluntary enlistment program will be an indication to the other nations of the world of our attitude toward our post-war commitments for international order and peace. The regular army offers men of 17 to 34 years of age security in the form of pay, allowances, and liberal retirement benefits. It also offers opportunities for education while in the service and following release under the GI Bill of Rights and the still more broadening phase of education gained by travel, experience, and the acquisition of new skills. As governor of one of the 48 states, I earnestly urge the people of this country, civic and service clubs, and all other public-spirited organizations to make every effort to assist in this urgent campaign to build up our peacetime regular army. Complete details concerning the opportunities offered to men who enlist in the regular army are available at your nearest United States Army recruiting station. <laughs> Act two of The Freedom of the Press, starring Dane Clark as Brad Evans. After the murder of James King, Brad hurried back to the newspaper to help set up the type. All right, Sam, you can give me a proof on this now. Okay. It'll be the usual. Oh, hello, Ellen. I uh, heard about your uncle, Ellen. I took the liberty of coming down. I thought he would have wanted the paper to go out anyhow. The paper? Do you think the paper matters now? It was the most important thing in his life. His life is ended. I... I came here to tell Sam to close up the shop. No, no. No, please, Ellen, let me tell you something. 
If it were in my power to change what's past, I'd change everything I said to your uncle two weeks ago. It's... Well, it's too late for that, but there's still one thing I can do if you'll let me. Can you bring him back, Brad? No, but I can see that the crusade he started isn't finished. I can see that truth and justice still get a hearing. I can think I can, I can point the way to a better day, a day when the Casey's and all the rest like them will be afraid to show their faces in American cities. Afraid? You're talking about being afraid? Yes, I know. I deserve that, Ellen. Once. But I don't anymore. All I ask is that you have faith in me, just enough faith to let me try to carry on where your uncle left off. Oh, Brad, I... Look, Ellen, do I have your faith? Oh, Brad, you have more than that. You have my faith. And my love, you've always had it. I'll prove worthy, darling. I promise you. But now, Sam, yeah. bring that proof. Okay. Oh, Brad, do you think we can do it? Can we? Can we? Look, Ellen, we are. Come on, I'll make up the presses, and Ellen, you've got to proofread this, if you will. We've got a paper to get out. <laughs> This is Dane Clark speaking. A few hours later, another edition of the Bulletin was in the hands of its readers, carrying on the spirit of its martyred editor, James King. Inspired by leadership like this, America awoke to the gravity of the situation. Reform movements brought justice to James Casey and hundreds like him. Thus came the successful end of James King's forceful campaign and the beginning of a great journalistic tradition for American newspapers. This is C.P. McGregor speaking, and I hope you've enjoyed our proudly we hailed story starring Dane Clark. Before leaving you, I am pleased to present Lieutenant General Ira C. Aker, Deputy Commander, Army Air Forces. General Aker. Many people had their first glimpse of the new age of air power during the recent mass flight of 25 P-80 shooting stars across the nation. Many people have read in current newspaper releases about long-range bombers now about to fly which will double the range of the B-29 super fortresses which destroyed Japan's war machine. If the security of our nation is to be maintained, we must all consider the implications of these great advancements in speed and range of weapons through the air. Continent to continent warfare is a possibility right now. All the prime industrial powers of the world are located north of the 30 degree north latitude line. This line runs through New Orleans, Cairo, and Chongqing. Every great industrial center can be hit by a plane with the B-29's range flying from a, from a base near the Arctic Circle. An enemy plane could make a one-way crossing of the polar area, the shortest air route, and strike any of our key manufacturing zones. Planes with 10,000-mile range and supersonic speeds are now about to fly. An enemy now needs sub-Arctic bases to reach our most important production centers. In a few years, these northern bases may be unnecessary. If we are to maintain the security of our nation until permanent peace is won, we must have a strong air force in being, one that can move at a moment's notice to destroy the war chest of any aggressor nation. This is our most vital defense requirement today. Thank you, General Aker. Our thanks also to Governor Ford and Mr. Dane Clark for appearing on this program. Proudly We Hail will come to you again over this station next week. Listen in. <laughs>